Hello and welcome to the third section of this Learning VMware Horizon course, Designing and Deploying VMware Horizon 7. So what are we going to learn in this section? So in this section, we're going to concentrate on the design aspects of your Horizon 7 environment. We'll start with an overview of how you should approach the project and the steps and processes you need to work through from building out your initial business case to proving the technology and then finally deploying your production environment. A big part of this initial work is to build a picture and understand your current user environment and what specifically you should be looking out for. Once armed with the data from the current environment and the project outline, you can now move into the design phase and look at how to build the solution, working with the VMware Horizon View architecture as our design blueprint. We'll also look at how to add DR and scalability into the solution with the CloudPod architecture, before finishing off the section by looking at some of the design elements for building vSphere to host your virtual desktops and the design of the virtual desktops themselves. So let's get started and let's take a look at how to define your project. To understand the project process, we're going to break it down into three key phases. So let's have a look at those phases in a little bit more detail. The first phase is project definition. In this phase, we're going to look at the business elements of the project, identifying both business and use cases. We'll also conduct an assessment to understand the current environment from a user's perspective and an infrastructure overview. The second phase is all about proving the chosen technology and that it delivers against all of your requirements. It gives you the opportunity to test the solution in your own environment. The final phase is all about taking the information from the first two phases, along with the assessment data, and then designing an environment that suits your requirements. Don't forget to make sure that you refer back to your project definition and success criteria as you work through the deployment to make sure you remain on track with your original goals. So now let's begin to dive a little deeper into the project phases. And we'll start with phase one, the project definition and what that means. Let's start with identifying business drivers. Before you jump headlong into your Horizon project, take a step back and ensure that you document what you're actually trying to achieve. More often than not, it can be very easy to get carried away with all the new shiny technological aspects of the solution, such as the install and config of new hardware and software, that the end goal is either lost or is not relevant to the business. It may be an obvious point to make, but the key to identifying the business drivers is to really understand what you want to evaluate. By this we mean, is it a strategic decision based on the need to transform your organization with new working initiatives? Or is there a more compelling event such as the end of life of an operating system or an application? It may even simply be the need to reduce costs. Whatever the case, you need to get that nailed down, written up and documented on day one. So the project has meaning and direction. And even more importantly, provide a baseline to refer back to when it comes to review time to gauge whether or not the project has been successful. Start by writing a document of requirements that lists the business needs, the current problems you need to solve, the vision, and any compromises and assumptions. As you progress through your project, you should regularly refer back to this document to keep yourself focused on the end goal. Next, we're gonna look at how to build a business case. Once you've defined the drivers behind an initiative or the compelling event that's kicked off the project and understood high level objectives, the next stage is to start building the business case around these. This requires you to go to the next level of detail and to start drilling into the specific areas the solution needs to address. To do this, you need firstly to understand the business strategy and then identify the key stakeholders for the project. You can then start to define the high level requirements of each of the areas identified as drivers and also start to define user segmentation. For example, you could look at what different user types you have, how they work today and what they're gonna to need going forward. At the end of the day, it will be the users that decide whether or not the project is a success, not you. And this leads us into the next session, the assessment phase. Desktop assessments. Once you've built your business case and validated against your strategy and identify that there is a requirement for a new way of delivering a desktop environment, the next stage is to run an assessment. So what does that mean? What's involved? It comes down to several things we're looking for. This includes examining your current desktop landscape by means of some form of desktop assessment so that you can understand what is currently being delivered, to whom it's being delivered, and more importantly, how resource intensive it is. The assessment is designed to build up a picture of what the current environment actually looks like. And some of the key metrics you're looking for are things like what users are using which applications, how much resource is the application using, login times, applications that may be unsuitable for VDI, client operating systems, and any current delivery mechanisms, etc. What you are ultimately looking to achieve is to create a baseline of what your environment looks like today. Then, as you move into defining the success criteria and proving the technology, you have a baseline as a reference point to demonstrate how you've improved current functionality and delivered on the business case. 
When it comes to assessment tools, there are a number of different third-party products on the market that you can use to conduct a desktop assessment. And you're often able to use the services of a partner to assist with the process so that you understand the information from the assessment. In this course, we're just going to talk about one particular tool, and that's Liquidware Stratosphere. What that tool does is actually collects your data from your desktops. It looks at current usage, resources, login times, and all the information that you need about your desktop environment. However, it's not just about raw physical data. As well as the actual collecting of this data, there are another couple of points that you should take into consideration. This will help you understand what some of the raw data is actually telling you. For example, it may tell you that a particular user is unsuitable to have a virtual desktop due to the amount of resources they consume. However, when you actually speak to that user, you may find that whatever they're doing isn't going to be used or relevant in VDI. You need to understand what your users actually do. So while working in an IT department, you often have a good level of understanding of the tasks that users undertake and the software they use to achieve these tasks on a daily basis. However, this can usually be a lot more complex than it may first appear. By undertaking the desktop assessment, you gather a granular level of understanding about the processes, applications and experience the users are getting from their existing desktops. This will include the applications they use and those that they don't use, including the installed versions, capacity, performance, etc, etc. Applications. Understanding the applications in use is going to be a key element moving forward. This will have an impact in many areas, including the number of desktop pools, the pool design, whether or not to use application virtualization, and potentially whether the desktop gets assigned to the user as a non-persistent or a persistent desktop. With these metrics gathered from the assessment, you'll be able to fully understand the current situation of your estate. It's not uncommon to find that many disparate versions of software, meaning potential security risks, and in other cases, key applications crashing. This information will help you build a business case for change and to help you prioritize your rollout to the users with the biggest security holes or the worst user experience. If you don't undertake a desktop assessment, it is likely that your desktops might be sized in one of two ways. The first would be by sizing your desktops based on a manufacturer's minimum recommendation, and you will size based on the specifications of a physical desktop PC, which will potentially be the most cost effective, but is likely to cause you the most amount of problems. The flip side would be to base your desktops on the software manufacturer's recommended specs. While your users might end up happy with this solution, it is likely that it's going to cost you the most and potentially mean that you will fail to get a sign off for your project. By undertaking a desktop assessment, you can actually understand what the performance curves look like throughout the working day. You're likely to see many dips and spikes throughout that day, such as login storms, antivirus scans, log off storms, and other metrics such as increased internet usage during a lunch break. If you work in an education environment, you may see many log on and log off storms throughout the day. And it's important to understand this, as you'll need to ensure your solution is designed to meet these requirements. This information can be used to help guide you when sizing the relevant desktop pools, but bear in mind that potentially you are going to be making changes to the desktops between assessment and deployment. This may be something such as migrating from Windows 7 to Windows 10, or moving to a desktop that has heavily been optimised in comparison to an OEM installation of Windows. The assessment will have been performed on the previous version of the OS, and therefore may not be 100% accurate. User experience. Above all else, what matters is user experience, which is the measurement of how good or how poor the end user's experience of using their desktop actually is. When you undertake a server virtualization project, if done correctly, the users will probably never even realize it's happened. With a desktop virtualization or any other EUC type project, it is more likely that they will realize a change has happened, and you need to ensure that this is a positive experience. The measurements of user experience will be wide and varied, but the reason will include elements such as boot times, application load times, login times, and other failures that might occur that you need to account for. As you are progressing through the proof of concept pilot and tuning processes, you need to ensure that the user experience is constantly improving. Failing to take the user experience into consideration will result in a definite failure of the project. Floor walks, interviews, and department champions. While the desktop assessment process is an important part of any UUC project, it should not replace the need to interact with end users. The benefit of human involvement is that you are able to pick up elements that simply would not be possible with software alone. Start by simply walking through the office, noting what the users are doing, applications they're using, accessories, how many screens, laptops, PCs, and so on. Once you have this high level understanding, consider booking meetings with key business leaders in each department to understand their needs, requirements, and the problems they have with their desktop today. You should also start considering who your department champions are going to be. So what are department champions? If you're going to make a short list of takeaway considerations from this course, department champions should be pretty high on your list. 
A department champion is a user who is going to be the go-to person within the department for everything to do with the department's desktop design, testing and support. They don't need to be IT experts, but should have a desire to help you improve their overall desktop experience. You will work with these champions to help you with the design of their desktops, as they will feel part of your project. By working with the department champion, you will have a sponsor within the department. They will have a sense of pride over what is being rolled out, and will be there to help you sculpt the desktop, and be the user on your side to explain why certain decisions have been made. Defining the success criteria The key objective in defining the success criteria is to document what a good solution should look like for the project to succeed and become production ready. You need to clearly define the elements that need to function correctly in order to move from proof of concept to proof of technology and then into pilot before finally going into production. You need to fully document what these elements are and get the end users or other project stakeholders to sign up to them. It's almost like creating a statement of work with a clearly defined list of tasks. One important factor is to ensure that during this phase of the project the criteria doesn't start to grow beyond the original scope. That means that any other additional elements should not get added to the success criteria, or at least not without discussing them first. It may well transpire that something key was missed. However, if you've conducted your assessment thoroughly, that should never happen. Another thing that works well at this stage is to again involve the end users. Set up a steering committee or advisory panel by selecting different people from different departments to act as sponsors within their particular area of the business. Actively involve them in the testing phases but get them on board early to get their input in shaping the solution from the outset. Too many projects fail when an end user tries something that didn't work. However, the thing that they tried was not actually relevant use case or something that is used by the business as a critical line of business application, and therefore shouldn't have derailed the project. Just as a side note, I once saw a VDI project fail to the unresponsiveness of Microsoft Paint, which knocked the project way off course while the issue was investigated. The upshot was that Paint was not actually used by anyone, and so was totally irrelevant to the business or use case, but it still burned pressure cycles while trying to enhance the performance. If we have a set of success criteria defined up front that the end users have signed up to, anything outside that criteria is not in scope. If it's not defined in the document, it should be disregarded as part of what success should look like.